pre presentation from uh, Professor Patrick Mason. Uh, he is uh, the uh, he became uh, the chair of Mormon study at Kremen Graduate School uh, Graduate University in 2011. He received his PhD in U.S. history from University of Notre Dame. And uh, he also served as the Dean of the School of Arts and Humanities. He has many publications. I have one here. <laughs> what is Mormonism? Because I know that uh, uh, today his topic, what is Mormon church? This is what I gave. And uh, he published this book uh, just last year. Also, he has other book, Out of Obscurity, Mormonism since 1945. Another one, Direction in Mormon Studies in 21st Century. And uh, then, uh, Printed. Belief and uh, Belonging in Age of Doubt. And uh, Mormon Menace, Violence, and Anti-Mormonism. Professor Mason has been uh, featured in national media, including appearance in New York Times, Los Angeles Times, Washington Post, National Public Radio, PBS, NBC News, and CNN. He is president of the Mormon History Association from 2017 to 18. So I think uh, Mormonism is a very important religion in United States and uh, uh, I try to find the best speaker <laughs> that we have available and he is the most uh, authoritative person to talk about this topic and uh, so we are very glad that he, uh, you are willing to come to our group uh, to talk to us. And uh, the first hour and more, I guess uh, it, you have one hour and 15 minutes to talk. And after that, we have one hour of Q&A. And uh, now, let you <laughs> do it. OK. Thank you. hooked up. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to stand up because I like to do that while I lecture. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you for, for having me here. Uh, as, as he said, this is actually an interesting week uh, for, for me to be here because there's a lot of changes going on in the Mormon church this week because the, the leader of the church, the president of the church just died last week. Uh, his funeral services will actually be tomorrow. Uh, he was 90 years old. Uh, and then the, the, uh, we'll get a new president of the church uh, next week. Uh, I heard you mention the name Russell Nelson, who is uh, presumptively the, the, the president of the church. I can talk about that a little bit more. Uh, I also heard a couple of chuckles. I assume it's because you mentioned that he's 93 years old. Uh, and uh, so, so a lot of questions about that. In fact, just this morning, I was on National Public Radio or doing an interview with National Public Radio about the next president and the change in, in the leadership and, and so forth. So, so Mormonism is in the news this week and, and, and next week, so it's a, a happy coincidence that I was uh, scheduled to come this week. Uh, so again, thank you for the inv invitation and thank you for, for all coming. 
so I just want to uh, offer a, f a few basics ab about the religion. We'll talk a little bit about the history of the religion, where it came from. We will talk about uh, some of the basic beliefs of the of the religion, and then I'd be I'll be very happy to answer any questions that you have about it. So, Mormonism. Uh, many people have heard of Mormonism. Uh, you have probably seen uh, Mormon missionaries, uh, two young men in, in white shirts and ties, maybe knocking in, on your door, increasingly young women uh, as, as well. Uh, so it's not just young men. So many people have seen Mormons or have heard about Mormonism, but oftentimes, uh, uh, even in this country, let alone around the world, uh, they don't know very much about the religion. And so, and, and we know this from survey uh, data. So that a few years ago, uh, a company did a big national survey in which they called people up and they said, uh, we want you to describe Mormonism in just one word or, or, or maybe a short phrase or something like that. So, so when, when we say Mormonism, what's the first thing that, that comes to mind? Uh, and so, this may be too small for some of you to see, but the number one answer was polygamy uh, for people, uh, so around the country. And so they, they <coughs> uh, interviewed 1,400 people. I mean, there were many, many answers, but the number one answer was polygamy. The number two answer was family or family values. Mormons are known for having large families and strong families, putting a lot of emphasis on families. The next answer was cult, so, so many people uh, believe or have been taught that Mormonism is a cult, uh, uh, which is a pejorative term. And so, so it's, it's a kind of a mix, you know, as, as people were interviewed about Mormonism, it's a mix of sort of good things, like that they are good or faithful or devout, but also things that, that we would see as, as somewhat negative, like polygamy uh, or cult or, or different or, or something like that. And so there's a lot of confusion in, uh, <coughs> certainly in the, in the United States and around the world about what Mormonism is, where it comes from, uh, what, what the basic beliefs are. So we'll, we'll try to clear some of that up uh, today. Um, we will talk about polygamy, though. Um, so just to give you a sense, and, and, and because this is a group of people who, who cares about religion and studies it, this, this, uh, this will come as no news to you, but it's, sometimes it's helpful to understand Mormonism in relationship to other Christian groups. So Mormonism is a uh, Christian uh, religion. There are, there are some who would dispute that claim. Uh, uh, who, would, who would say that Mormonism is a kind of heresy, uh, but, but nevertheless, uh, certainly scholars would say that Mormonism fits comfortably within, uh, or, or not always comfortably, but it's certainly Mormonism fits within Christianity. So if we think, and this is a very rough schematic, um, but if, if we think about the early origins of the Christian movement or the Jesus movement, uh, over the next thousand years, it essentially uh, manifested itself in, in different ways. Of course, we had the, the original early Eastern churches in Syria. Uh, we had Coptic Christianity in Egypt. Uh, so these are the very earliest churches that, uh, that emerged in the century or two after the death of Jesus. Then, of course, we have the, the largest and uh, and, and also uh, with those churches, the oldest manifestation of Christianity, which of course would be Roman Catholicism, which is headed by Pope Francis today, has you know, close to a billion members. Uh, and then we have all of the Eastern Orthodox churches, which have now uh, evolved into the various national churches. So the Russian Orthodox Church, the Greek, or or uh, Greek Orthodox Church, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, okay? Roman Catholicism, as you know, uh, 500 years ago, uh, last year, uh, we just celebrated the, or commemorated the 500th anniversary of Martin Luther and the beginnings of the Protestant Reformation in the year 1517 in Germany, which led to great diversity uh, within uh, the Christian family. There are now well, over, there, there are thousands of Christian churches. Just within, uh, within the United States, there are over 2,000 different varieties of Christianity, if you count all the different little churches and denominations and everything. So Protestantism brought real diversity uh, to the Christian family of churches, <coughs> conflict as well, of course, uh, uh, and, and these, these different manifestations of Christianity have often been in conflict with one another. 
But most recently, I th the, the most recent additions, uh, especially major additions to uh, Christianity, uh, would be Mormonism and Pentecostalism. Mormonism emerging in the 19th century, as I'm, um, as I'm gonna talk about in a moment, and then Pentecostalism emerging uh, in the very late 19th century, or really most especially at the beginning of the 20th century. And of course, Pentecostalism, one of the places for its origins was right here in Los Angeles uh, with the Azusa Street revivals in 1906. And Pentecostalism now claims, it, 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 it of course is not a single church, it's a, it's a phenomenon, it's a, it's a style or mode that claims many, many different kinds of denominations and, and worshipers, but in, in the hundreds of millions all around the world. And uh, Pentecostalism has been uh, phenomenally uh, successful. Some people would say it's the most vibrant form of Christianity today. Uh, and, uh, but we're gonna focus today on Mormonism, uh, which uh, much smaller than any of these other forms. So uh, Mormonism, uh, the formal name is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the largest of the body. There are other uh, smaller churches uh, that are related to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but the largest is the uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. It's a very long name, uh, but of oftentimes called the LDS Church uh, or, or simply the Mormon Church. And there are about 16 million Mormons around the world. More than half of those are outside the United States. So now there's uh, roughly six or seven million Mormons inside the United States and uh, about eight to 10 million Mormons outside of the United States. And I'll, I'll show where, where they live primarily. Okay, so where did Mormonism come from? Uh, I heard Joseph Smith mentioned. So Joseph Smith is the key figure in the history of the religion. Uh, Joseph Smith was American. Born in 1805 in the state of Vermont in New England. Uh, came from a uh, poor farming family. And his family moved around a fair bit because of economic difficulties. And they finally ended up in western New York, upstate New York. And Joseph Smith, uh, it was a <coughs> not a family with any particular uh, uh, religious, uh, there was nothing distinctive about them. The father was, uh, was Christian, but not affiliated with any churches. The, the mother was uh, broadly evangelical, sort of vacillated between Methodism and Presbyterianism. And so this was the milieu that, that Joseph Smith uh, grew up in. Uh, he, he talked about attending various churches or various revivals. Uh, this, this was a time, especially in, we in Western New York, of great revivals of religion. In, in American religious history, we call this the Second Great Awakening, where there were many, many revivals, especially among Protestant churches. And, and many Protestant ministers and revivalists would come through the area and hold revivals uh, and preach and, and try to claim converts to their church. And Joseph Smith talked about as a young man, so he was, uh, he was a teenager, and he said that he was confused by all of these competing claims of religion, uh, that you would have a Baptist minister, a Presbyterian minister, a Methodist minister, all reading from the same Bible, of course, but interpreting it very differently, and uh, saying that all the others were going to hell, <laughs> and, and only uh, his followers were, were going to heaven. And in fact, in the town that Joseph Smith lived in, uh, at the intersection of, of, of the two main roads, there was literally a different Christian church on all four corners, right? And so he talked about being very confused. He says, if there's one God, if there's one Jesus Christ, if there's one Bible, why are there so many different Christian churches, right? How, and how would a person even settle which church is true? And so he, uh, uh, as, as he uh, recorded the story in his history, he was reading in the Bible one day. Uh, he was 14 years old, so still a very young man. Uh, 14 years old, reading in the Bible, and the Bible said that if, if anyone lacks wisdom, he should ask of God. So Joseph Smith decided to take that seriously, and he went out, he lived on a farm in a rural area. Uh, he went to the woods, uh, to the forest near his house, and he says he knelt down to pray. And Joseph Smith reported, and so this is all happening in the year 1820, the spring of 1820. 
And Mormons remember this event as the first vision. Because in this vision, when Joseph Smith knelt to pray to ask God which church he should join, he says that he was visited by two beings who came down from heaven. They were glorious and, and, uh, and so forth. And he says that they came down. Uh, one introduced the other as his beloved son or as Jesus Christ. And at that point, they told Joseph Smith not to join any of the churches. Uh, they said that all of the churches uh, were not true, that they were corrupt, and that uh, Joseph Smith would be called to do an important work. All right. So, uh, so Joseph Smith went away from this experience uh, and did not join any of the other churches. I, I think it's, it's sort of funny. He, he talks about how he, he came home from this. I mean, he had just talked to God, right? Uh, I mean, God had come down and talked to him face to face, uh, according to his recollections. And he said he, he went home and he sort of walked in the front door and he, he, was, he was drained from the experience. And his mother said, Joseph, what's, what's wrong? Is, is everything okay? And he says, Mom, I've, I've learned for myself that Presbyterianism is not true, <laughs> right? So that's, that's the great message that he got from talking to God, was not to join the Presbyterian church, uh, uh, which is the church that his mother was attending uh, at the time. So, so not much happened for the next couple of years. Joseph continued to be a farmer uh, with his family. Uh, but did not join any of the other churches. And the next great event, uh, which, which really propels him to his career as a prophet, uh, came in the year 1823, so three years later. Uh, Joseph, again, was praying uh, in his home, and he says he was visited by an angel uh, who came to his bedroom and talked to him. The angel introduced himself by name, said his name was Moroni that he had lived here on the American continent anciently, and that he was the last of a long line of prophets who had kept a record, and ultimately that he, Moroni, had buried that record in a hill, which was close to Joseph Smith's house. And so actually Joseph Smith said he had this same visit from, the Mor from Moroni, from the angel, four times that night in which, in his mind's eye, he was able to see where this record was buried in the hillside. So the very next day, Joseph Smith went to the hill. Uh, he said he, he, and he knew exactly where it was because he had seen it in his mind, and he says he, he moved this rock aside, he, he uncovered this rock, and underneath this rock were a set of golden plates. Uh, and that, uh, you know, our, from our best account was maybe about this big. I mean, the size of a large book, uh, but all made of gold. And uh, Joseph Smith, uh, when, when he discovered the plates, the angel Moroni appeared again uh, and told him he was not yet ready to receive the plates and that he needed to come back every year. So Joseph Smith went back year after year for four different years until finally in 1827, uh, uh, the angel Moroni allowed him to retrieve, to actually pull the plates out of the hill. And so this is what this image represents. Now, what were the plates? Uh, Moroni said, again, he, Moroni claimed to be an, an angel, a, a resurrected being, who had lived here in the Americas anciently. And that these golden plates were a record of the people who had lived here in the Americas uh, in ancient times. And he said that Joseph Smith was called as a prophet to translate uh, this, these plates into English. And so Joseph took the plates and over the course of the next couple of years, sort of in fits and starts, uh, said that he translated these golden plates into English. The, the gold plates were written in an ancient language that, of course, Joseph Smith didn't know. He was a poor farm boy. He, boy, he had very little education. So he said that God inspired him to be able to uh, translate these records. And so in the year 1830, <coughs> this is now 10 years after his first vision, in the year 1830, the Joseph Smith, who's 24 years old at this point, publishes what is known as the Book of Mormon. And why is it called the Book of Mormon? 
we, because the main, uh, the, the, the main narrator or editor of this record of the Golden Plates was a prophet named Mormon. Uh, and so the book was named after him. And the, the book, I, I should have brought a copy of it, but it's about, it's almost 600 pages long. Uh, it's, a, it's a complicated uh, work of scripture. It's similar, if, if you're familiar with the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament, it's similar to the Old Testament in structure and style in that it mixes both narrative, so, so there are characters in it and, and, and you get to know these prophets, but it also includes prophecy and poetry and a number of different genres similar to the Hebrew Bible. And essentially what the Book of Mormon is, is it's a, it's a story, it's a family story. And it begins about 600 years before Christ, so 600 BCE. And it begins actually not in the Americas, but in Jerusalem. And it begins with the story of a prophet, otherwise unknown in the Bible, uh, but a prophet named Lehi. Lehi was teaching the people in Jerusalem, uh, <coughs> and God came to him in a vision and said that he needed to take his family and leave into the wilderness, that Jerusalem was about to be destroyed, which it was in 586 BC by the Babylonians. Uh, and so Lehi needed to take his family into the wilderness. Uh, and so the early chapters of the book talk about how Lehi and his family leave Jerusalem, go into the wilderness, and eventually, inspired by God, build a boat and they sail in a boat from the Arabian Peninsula over to the Americas, to the Promised Land, as it is called. And so this is, again, this is about 600 years before Christ, <coughs> and what the Book of Mormon does is it tells the story of the civilization that they build here in the Americas over the next thousand years. So the Book of Mormon covers a thousand years of history from 600 years before Christ to about 400 years after Christ, it tells of two rival civilizations, one civilization which for the most part was unbelieving, uh, whereas the other civilization was believing and Christian. And the, the, that's the key part of the, of the story here is that the Book of Mormon is a deeply Christian book. The prophets in the Book of Mormon talk about Christ. Uh, they prophesy of Christ, and the, the, the climax of it, the narrative climax of the Book of Mormon comes about midway through when uh, Jesus Christ, the resurrected Jesus Christ, uh, after his ministry in Jerusalem, as is recorded in the New Testament, and you remember in the New Testament, he teaches, he dies, he res is resurrected, and then he ascends up into heaven. Uh, and the Book of Mormon says that after his ascension into heaven, which is recorded in the New Testament, <coughs> he came back to earth and visited the people here in the Americas. And the Book of Mormon tells that story. It is the record of Jesus Christ's visit to the Americas. So this is art which depicts that. So it's a deeply Christian book that teaches a Christian gospel, which is very similar to what you find in the New Testament. In fact, when Jesus comes, he teaches a sermon very similar to the Sermon on the Mount, including the Lord's Prayer, uh, which, you, which you talked about today. Um, and so the Book of Mormon uh, is, is, uh, becomes this foundational scripture for the group of people who believe that Joseph Smith has been called as a prophet. It begins with his family, uh, with some of his close friends, and then it begins to spread as they send out missionaries, they take the Book of Mormon around, people read it, are convinced that it is the Word of God, that it's scripture, uh, and then uh, they convert to the movement and the movement begins to grow. All right, so, so Mormonism, even though, it, it, as I said, it begins in New York, here in the northeastern part of the United States, but at every point in its early history, Mormons were persecuted uh, for, for their different beliefs and sometimes their different social and cultural practices. So it begins in western New York in 1830, <coughs> less than a year after the publication of the Book of Mormon, the, the small Mormon community, the small uh, group of people who follow Joseph Smith, and originally they're called Mormonites because of the Book of Mormon. It's, it's kind of a nickname. It's, it's actually meant to make fun of them, but eventually they sort of just own the, owned the name. So uh, less than a year after the beginning of the church, the church moves 
<coughs> and has two headquarters, one uh, in Kirtland, Ohio, which is near Cleveland, and the other on the western border of Missouri, which at the time was the western border of the United States. This is still early in the nation's history and it's still moving west. It's right on the border, as you can see here, of Indian country. Uh, because of persecution, uh, they were forced to move again. And in fact, the darkest chapter in Mormon history occurs in the state of Missouri, uh, especially in the year 1838. Uh, Mormons had been in conflict with their local, with the, the neighbors, with uh, the non-Mormon settlers there. It eventually uh, led to violence between the two groups. Uh, and then in the fall of 1838, the governor of the state of Missouri uh, issued an extermination order against the Mormons. He said that Mormons had to leave the state of Missouri or they would be exterminated. Uh, it's, uh, it's the only case like that in the history of the United States where a state official has, uh, has signed a legal order uh, to, to kill or exterminate the members of a religious uh, community, a religious minority. Uh, and in fact, a number of Mormons were killed, a number of women were raped. It was a very dark moment. Uh, there was a, a horrible massacre. Um, and so Mormons were forced to leave the state of Missouri and became refugees. They were taken in by the people of the state of Illinois, and they formed a new community there uh, in, in, in a place called Nauvoo, Illinois, which is on the banks of the Mississippi River. Uh, and Nauvoo very, grew very quickly. Uh, for a time, it was actually larger than Chicago, or about the same size as Chicago, as Chicago was still uh, getting, getting bigger. Uh, but, but things, again, conflict uh, caught up to them. And in 1844, uh, Joseph Smith, the founding prophet of Mormonism, was killed by a mob. Uh, he was actually being held in a, a jail at the time, and a mob uh, stormed the jail and killed Joseph Smith and his brother, Hiram. Uh, many people believed that when, when Joseph Smith died, that the Mormon movement would just disappear, that, that, that it it would, uh, pe people would just uh, fall away. Um, and, uh, but in fact, that's not what happened, obviously, because we're here talking about Mormonism. And, uh, and immediately after that, uh, the, the Mormons, or the Latter-day Saints, moved, they, they left Nauvoo, again because of the violence, and they moved now clear across the country uh, to what is now Salt Lake City or Utah. Has anybody ever been to Salt Lake City? Okay, so some of you might have even been to the temple and, and, and seen some of those things. And so this is where Brigham Young comes in. So if Joseph Smith is easily the most important person, uh, you know, in most influential person in Mormon history, Brigham Young is probably s the second most influential. Brigham Young was the one who led the Mormons across the plains, who led the Mormon pioneers. And this is a remarkable journey. I mean, a 2,000 mile journey by foot over land, uh, unsettled land. Of course, many Mormons died along the way, uh, along the Pioneer Trail. But Brigham Young became the second president and prophet of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and, uh, and, and held that position for about 30 years. Uh, so enormously uh, in influential, I mean, I'll come back to this. Mormons came and they settled, not just uh, Salt Lake City, but all of this area here was originally settled by Mormons, including San Bernardino. Uh, Mormons uh, were the first settlers of San Bernardino. Mormons were among the very first people in San Francisco. Mormons founded Las Vegas, uh, and many of the other settlements here in the Intermountain West and Southwest. Uh, for a number of different reasons, they eventually consolidated into what we now know as Utah. Uh, but, but Mormons were under the leadership of Brigham Young were primarily responsible for the settlement of the Southwest, which at the time, uh, very few whites uh, were in. It was, it was largely inhabited by Native Americans, but not by very many whites. Okay. Now, uh, of course, Mormons continued to attract controversy, mostly because of their most famous or infamous teaching and practice, which was polygamy. Uh, polygamy <coughs> uh, began under Joseph Smith, so Joseph Smith did introduce the practice, and uh, during his life, it was a secret practice. Uh, Joseph Smith was married to upwards of 30 women, 
Uh, the exact count is, is a little bit hard because it was done in secret. Uh, the historical record is not always clear, so probably somewhere around 25 or 30 women. Um, interestingly, w there's, no <coughs> there's no evidence that Joseph Smith had children uh, with any of those women. He did have children with his first wife, uh, his original wife, but, um, uh, but jo so Joseph Smith practiced polygamy secretly. He introduced the practice to some of his closest followers. Rumors about polygamy was one of the reasons why Joseph Smith uh, eventually was killed. Uh, but it was still very much a secret practice and practiced underground. Once the Mormons went to Utah, where they were able to sort of be by themselves and establish their own society, that's when they announced the practice and teaching of polygamy publicly. And, uh, and so under Brigham Young, uh, they, they began to practice it in the open. And, and that really carried on through most of the rest of the 19th century. And so you can see, uh, this led to very large families. <laughs> um, uh, this, is, uh, this is a man named Joseph F. Smith, who was the nephew of Joseph Smith, uh, with his, I believe he had seven wives uh, and many, many children. Uh, as you can see, but it also led to uh, many cartoons and, and, and people poked fun of the Mormons. I mean, this, this became uh, a, a lot of fun for cartoonists and, and novelists and, and other people. And so polygamy became a point of real conflict between Mormons and the rest of the nation and in fact uh, <coughs> helped spark a significant anti-Mormon movement. And this played out in lots of different ways. So you can see here, I've got different illustrations of this. Uh, one, this idea that, that Utah was hell upon earth and that Mormon missionaries were converting all of these women who would then come to Utah and, and, and then become uh, the polygamous slaves of, of Mormon patriarchs. There was a view that uh, Mormons at this time also uh, essentially set up a theocratic government. Brigham Young was both the prophet and president of the church, but also governor of the territory. And so there was no real separation of church and state in early pioneer Utah, which of course is, is, uh, uh, goes against democratic traditions in the United States. And so there was a fear not only of Mormon polygamy, but also Mormon theocracy. And so you'd get images like this where, where the Mormon political power was seen as spreading and, and if left unchecked, the Mormon political power would become a real danger to the nation. Uh, it's probably hard for you to see this, um, but this of course is the U.S. Capitol, the dome of the U.S. Capitol, and the language here says religious liberty is guaranteed, but can we allow foreign reptiles to crawl all over us? And the two reptiles are the Roman Catholic Church and the Mormon Church. This was also a time of profound anti-Catholicism in this country as well. Um, but it's interesting that they saw Mormons as a foreign religion, even though it had, it had been born and grown up here in the United States. And then this is an illustration, actually my, my first book was about anti-Mormonism in the late 19th century South, and in that time a number of Mormon missionaries were killed. Uh, and in fact, so this was a note that was delivered to a Mormon missionary threatening him if he didn't leave town. Uh, and the, the note on the other side of this said, a charitable hint to Mormons. Uh, and so, so there were violent threats, uh, a, n a number of, of Mormons were killed, and it was not just uh, kind of vigilantes, uh, but in fact the U.S. government was, uh, was involved in anti-Mormonism, every branch of the government. So the, uh, in 1879, the United States Supreme Court ruled in a very famous case called Reynolds v. U.S. that Mormons could believe in polygamy, but they could not practice it. That, uh, that the uh, First Amendment, which protects free exercise of religion, did not extend to polygamy uh, or other practices that were seen as being against the law. And so this created, a, this is a very important case in American history and in American law because it created what's called the belief action distinction that in the United States you can believe whatever you want, but you cannot necessarily practice whatever you want or do whatever you want under the guise of religion. And this has been debated ever since. Uh, so, the, so the Supreme Court ruled against the Mormons. <coughs> Congress passed a series of laws 
against the Mormons beginning in 1862 under Abraham Lincoln and continuing through the 1880s, which eventually in 1887 Congress disincorporated the church. It essentially stripped the church of all of its property. It threatened to take away the church's temples and other properties uh, and imprisoned. Many of the Mormon leaders at the time were thrown in prison uh, for the practice of polygamy. Uh, so this was also, the 1880s was a dark time for, for Mormonism. And then the executive branch as well, uh, the President of the United States, uh, so a series of about five presidents in a row, in every State of the Union address in the late 1870s and 1880s, when the presidents addressed Congress, they identified Mormons as one of the main threats to the nation. Uh, so now, you know, they would get up and talk about ISIS and Islamic terrorists or something like that. But in the 1880s, they were talking about Mormons uh, as, uh, as one of the great threats to the nation. Uh, and in fact, the Secretary of State uh, in 1877 sent a letter to uh, European governments asking them to stop Mormon immigrants from coming to this country. Uh, so they tried to create an immigration ban based on uh, religious belief. And so we, we're seeing some of those th same things in our country today, right? Uh, um, and so a very pronounced anti-Mormon strain. Uh, but the 20th century was actually quite a different story. And so if the 19th century is a story, of course, of Mormon origins and also Mormon survival against uh, uh, heated opposition, in the 20th century, Mormonism has been phenomenally successful uh, in becoming a mainstream, uh, excuse me, a mainstream religion in this country. And there are, there are lots of things that we can point to. Uh, the Mormon Tabernacle Choir is one of the most famous choirs in the country. It's has sung for many presidents and other things. Of course, Mitt Romney ran for president in 2008 and 2012, uh, nearly won in 2012. Uh, Brigham Young University has been very successful in athletics. The Winter Olympics went to Salt Lake uh, in 2002. Uh, you had the Book of Mormon musical. Has anybody seen the Book of Mormon musical? Uh, it was on Broadway. It came here to the Pantages uh, a couple of different times. So very successful uh, musical production. And of course, Mormons have been very successful in business as well. The Marriott's uh, are, are, are Mormon and, and a number of other leading corporate leaders. And so Mormons have worked very, very hard over the past hundred years to become mainstream. And one of the ways they did this is by giving up polygamy. The church uh, officially abandoned polygamy in 1890, so more than a hundred years ago. Took a few years for it to really uh, kind of uh, peter out, but, 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 but uh, so, so now people still associate Mormonism with polygamy, as we saw in that survey, but in fact, uh, Mormons have not been uh, polygamous for more than a hundred years. There are offshoot sects and fundamentalist sects of, of Mormonism that do continue to practice polygamy. They'll occasionally show up in the news, but the mainstream Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, if, if you have those Mormon missionaries knock on your door, uh, that they're not polygamous and Mormons have not been polygamous for more than 100 years. They gave up theocracy and joined in every way sort of the cultural, political mainstream in the United States. Well, so Mormons have tried very hard to be normal. Uh, did it work? Do, do people think they're normal? Uh, <coughs> well, this is another survey. These are surveys that were taken in 2014-2017. And these are uh, <coughs> what social scientists call their feeling thermometers. So what they do is they call people up on a survey and they say, we're going we're gonna to list a bunch of religions and we want you to tell us from, uh, give us a number from one to a hundred of how warmly you feel about that particular religion. One hundred being that you love them, they're the greatest thing ever, one being they're the worst thing ever and, and we should get rid of them, okay? So, so the higher the score, the more warmly Americans feel about these particular religions. So it's very interesting. The most popular, according to these polls, the most popular religion in America, or the one that people feel most warmly about, is Judaism, right? It's, it's, uh, this, is not, this would not have been the case 100 years ago. Uh, with c Catholics and mainline Protestants and evangelical Christians right behind them, okay? But if you can see, the three least popular religions, or not religions, in the United States are Muslims, atheists, and Mormons. 
All right. Now, all three have become somewhat more popular from 2014 to 2017, but it's remained the same. Muslims, atheists, and Mormons are the three least popular groups um, in the United States. Now, it's a little bit different each generation. This chart breaks it out according to generation. For those who are 65 or over, atheists and Muslims are definitely uh, the least popular. And Mormons are grouped right around here with Buddhists and, and Hindus. Okay? But for the youngest people, for millennials, all right, Mormons are the least popular, even, even more unpopular than Muslims. Uh, so, it's, it, it's, it, so it varies by generation. So Mormons have done all this work to become normal, <laughs> right? And apparently nobody else is paying attention, right? Or, uh, uh, and, uh, or, or they remain deeply unpopular among the, the general American public. Okay, so, well, why do they remain unpopular? Why are Mormons, uh, why do they continue to be, uh, in their own eyes, misunderstood uh, and unliked by, uh, by, in many ways, the majority of the American population? Well, I think it's a combination of, of beliefs that are uh, different than mainstream Christianity uh, and also some practices. So I want to end over the next few minutes by talking about Mormon beliefs, some of the core beliefs of the religion, uh, and then also some of the core practices. All right. So as I said, Mormonism is a Christian religion. And so there are many things that are very similar to other Christian religions, whether Protestant, Catholic, or Orthodox. So Mormons believe in a Godhead of God the Father and Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost. Uh, but it's a little bit different. So oftentimes with Mormonism, you get things that look a lot like Christianity, but are just a little bit different, right? And in ways that make other Christians uncomfortable. So in this case, Mormons believe in God, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost, what other Christians call the Trinity. Mormons prefer the term the Godhead. But the, the key difference is, for most Christians, they believe that God, Jesus, and the Holy Ghost are three in one, that they are just one person, right, uh, in the Trinity. Uh, Mormons believe that they're actually three people, that if we saw God and Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost, they would sit in three different chairs, okay? Uh, and in fact, that God and Jesus Christ have tangible bodies, that so we could go up and shake their hands, okay? So they're not just a spirit, but in fact, a body. Mormons also believe in the existence of exalted uh, female uh, deities, uh, the most commonly called Heavenly Mother. So it's not just male deities or, or sexless deities, uh, but in fact that there's a Heavenly Mother and that Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother are a divine uh, couple. Okay, so, uh, so, so it's a little bit different. Mormons do believe in salvation through Jesus Christ, and so the, f the foundational principle of the, of the Mormon religion is faith in Jesus Christ, and they believe that through his love and his grace we are all saved. But Mormons do not just stop in thinking about salvation, but actually Mormons talk about exaltation. And they believe that human beings can not only be saved to live with God, for eternity, but in fact humans can become like God and can become gods and goddesses themselves uh, in the eternities. Uh, there are some parallels in Eastern Orthodox Christianity uh, about theosis and deification, but actually Mormons go beyond <coughs> any other Christian religion that I know of in, in, in terms of talking about the ability of human beings, every human being, to become a god or a goddess him or herself, and Mormons call this exaltation. Mormons have four books of scripture that they consider to be the word of God. So the Holy Bible, and this would be the same Bible that all other Christians read, Old <coughs> and New Testaments. Uh, Mormons generally prefer the King James Version, but, but they, would, they would read any version of the Bible. And then three distinctive books of scripture, the Book of Mormon that we already talked about, the Doctrine and Covenants, which is a collection of revelations to modern day prophets, mostly Joseph Smith, uh, and the Pearl of Great Price, which is sort of a book of, um, uh, it's, it's kind of where they threw all the stuff that they weren't quite sure where to put it, uh, otherwise. It's, it's a collection of different sacred writings uh, of, the, of the prophets. Mormons believe, and, and this goes back to Joseph Smith's first vision, they believe that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is God's one true church on the earth. 
They believe that other Christian churches are full of good people who do good things and are sincere in their beliefs, <coughs> but that ultimately those churches are not true, that they are in some way apostate or corrupt. Uh, Mormons oftentimes will use softer language than that, but that's the actual language that, that, they'll be, that they will use. And so they believe, because all of the other churches were, were corrupted in some way, that they teach uh, incorrect doctrine or, or something like that, that it required a restoration. So I, I'd heard you mention that word, restoration. So Mormons do not believe that they are the heirs of the Protestant Reformation. They're not just another Protestant denomination like Methodists and Baptists or something like that. Mormons believe that Jesus established the true church on the earth and handed it to his apostles, Peter, James, John, and the others. And then right about the time that the apostles died, the true church <coughs> went into corruption or went into apostasy. And that that lasted for 1,700 years until God called Joseph Smith to come back and restore the true church. Uh, they believed that the, the, the churches were so corrupt that it wasn't just a matter of changing some things or reforming the church, but that the true church needed to be restored. Uh, through a prophet, through revelation from God, and through the visit of angels. Uh, and so uh, Mormons continue to believe, so just as Joseph Smith was the founding prophet of the religion, Mormons believe that God calls prophets today, and that ever since the death of Joseph Smith, there's always been a prophet on the earth who is also the president of the church. And so Brigham Young became the second prophet and president of the church. And then there were 15 others after him until this past week, Thomas S. Monson, who had been president and prophet of the church since 2008. He just passed away. And then next week, probably, uh, the church will have a new president and prophet, Russell M. Nelson. Uh, and so the belief is that God continues to call prophets, and these prophets can speak the mind and will of God to the modern world. This is a very important belief, that, that God continues to reveal things to the world through the prophet. The other thing, the other core belief of Mormons is in, <coughs> I talked about how important families are for Mormons. Uh, Mormons believe that families exist not just here on earth, but through all eternity. So the, a husband and a wife, when they get married in a Mormon temple, they're not just married until death do you part, right, as we oftentimes hear, but in fact that that marriage, or Mormons call it a sealing, that that marriage can last into the eternities, and a husband and wife can be together forever and be with their children forever as well. So this is one of the reasons why Mormons value families so much. They don't just see it as a sort of temporary social and economic arrangement here on earth, uh, but they see it as a sacred union that lasts into the eternities. Okay, almost done here. <coughs> A few core Mormon practices. So those are some of the, the core Mormon beliefs. What are the, some of the core practices that distinguish them from other Christians? So one of the most famous and, uh, and uh, that the, you can see quite easily is called the Word of Wisdom. This is the health code of the church. So Mormons will not drink alcohol, good faithful Mormons. Uh, 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 of course, there's all kinds, right? But, but if they're living according to the teachings of the church, Mormons will not drink alcohol. They will not uh, take tobacco of any kind. They will not drink coffee or tea. Uh, uh, they will drink herbal tea, but not green tea or, or black tea, um, and, they, and not drugs of any kind other than, of course, uh, prescription drugs. Uh, so, th so this is very important for Mormon identity. Uh, Mormons will also, they're very committed to what they call the law of chastity, which means uh, that sex is reserved for a husband and wife in marriage. So no sex before marriage, no sex outside of marriage. And also, sex uh, can only be, be between a man and a woman. So Mormons uh, believe that homosexual sex uh, is a sin <coughs> in God's eyes. I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. Mormons uh, pay a tithing, like many other Christians, but they're quite strict on it being 10% of your income. Uh, that is paid uh, to the church. Mormons also have <coughs> uh, callings. And one of the distinctive things about the Mormon church is it does not have a professional ministry. 
It has a lay ministry. So if you, if you visit a Mormon congregation here in Rosemead or anywhere else around here, if you go in on, on a Sunday morning, you'll be greeted by people and at the front of the room will be a bishop who's the head of a local congregation. But he is not a full-time minister and he received no training no formal training in a seminary or a Bible school or anything like that. He is probably an insurance agent or a lawyer or an accountant or a plumber uh, or something like that. Uh, so Mormons, uh, the ministry is for all people of all professions, but there is no special and dedicated clergy except at the very top level of the leadership that is full time. But even they are not trained in seminary or anything like that. They're just called to a full time ministry. So it's a fully laid ministry and the Mormon congregation is entirely staffed uh, by volunteers. And virtually everybody in the congregation gets some kind of job, whether to teach the children or to work with the teenagers or to teach Sunday school class or, or do work with the women's group. Almost everybody has a job. None of it is paid, uh, including the bishop of the congregation. The bishop puts in many, many hours, usually 20 to 30 hours a week on top of his full time job. Uh, the priesthood in Mormonism is reserved only for men. Uh, so women serve in the church in a number of capacities, but they are not ordained to the priesthood. This has been a, 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 a there's been conflict around this, uh, of course, but like the Roman Catholic Church, uh, uh, Mormon, the Mormon Church uh, still does not ordain women, and I don't think that'll happen anytime in the future. Of course, missionary work is an important part of Mormonism. It's how it is spread all around the world, and so these are these uh, two young men knocking on your door, or young women. Um, there are now about 80,000 Mormon missionaries all around the world, uh, and they, they go to almost every country uh, where they're allowed. And then finally, uh, temple worship. This is a picture of the temple here in Los Angeles on Santa Monica Boulevard uh, over by UCLA. Uh, but there are temples all over the world. The Mormons have there's sort of two types of buildings a local building, which is just a regular chapel that anybody can go into. So you could go, I don't know where the nearest one here is, here around Rosemead, I imagine there's one within a couple of miles. Um, but anybody could go, Sunday services are open to visitors or anybody who would like to attend. But temples uh, are where Mormons do weddings and other sacred ceremonies, and those are only open to members of the church uh, who are in good standing. So if you went to this building in San, on Santa Monica Boulevard, uh, they have a visitor center that you could visit, uh, but you could not actually go into the temple unless you were a, a member in good standing. Okay, last, last thing. So as we move into the 21st century, what are the, the challenges and opportunities for Mormonism? Well, Mormonism continues to become increasingly international. As I said, there are now more Mormons outside the United States than inside the United States. And as you can see from this map, uh, the darker the color, the, the, the higher percentage of Mormons, you can see that, it, that Mormonism's greatest success has been in the Western Hemisphere. Over the past 50 years, it's had remarkable growth in, uh, in Latin American countries, Mexico and Brazil especially, but, uh, but other countries as well. Um, uh, you can see uh, the church has not spread to countries where it is illegal to proselytize. And so the church has not spread in Muslim majority countries or in China where Mormon missionaries are not allowed in. They are allowed into Taiwan and this is a picture of the, the temple in Taiwan. There's actually a sizable Mormon population in Taiwan. Um, right now, the, the, er, this map is a few years old, uh, the, the place of the greatest Mormon growth right now is actually in Western Africa uh, and in Southern Africa. And so uh, church growth is somewhat stagnated in the United States and in Europe, but in the global south it continues to grow. So there's again 16 million members and continuing to increase. Um, but the church faces uh, the, the same challenge that other uh, churches face, especially in Western Europe and uh, North America, that is of secularization. Fewer and fewer, uh, fewer people believe in God, fewer people are going to church. Uh, and so this, this will be a challenge, uh, and, and countries politically and socially and culturally are less protective or respectful <coughs> of religious values and religious norms. So, so the church faces the, the same challenges of secularization that are happening, especially across Europe and, and, the, and North America. 
right now, the biggest debates for the church, especially in, well, really all around the world, but especially here in the United States, are around gender and sexuality. As I said, the church does not ordain women to the priesthood. That has been a matter of uh, quite a bit of controversy. And the church has also taken a very strong stand against same-sex marriage. You may remember 10 years ago, Prop 8, uh, here in California, uh, the, the church came out strongly in favor of Prop 8, which, which, uh, which made uh, same-sex marriage illegal. And, uh, and the tr has this been a very controversial position? And of course, now same-sex marriage is legal in the United States, but the church continues to, um, uh, to, to teach that homosexuality is a sin. <coughs> uh, and so, uh, and, has, and has said that, uh, you know, religious freedom should allow for churches to, to take a different position and not be forced to accept same-sex marriage. So these are, <coughs> at the same time, there are many Mormons, including this group of Mormons, who uh, have become quite open and accepting towards the LGBT community. Um, and so even within the Mormon church, there's debate and conflict uh, over how the church should, should approach issues of, of gender and sexuality. So, so there are a lot of, I mean, as with any religious group, there are, there are debates and tensions and conflict within the group. Um, but, it, but it continues to grow, it continues to thrive, uh, especially here in the United States, but also uh, all around the world. And so we should expect to see Mormonism continue to grow. So that's, uh, I, th I think that's what I have to say. We'll take a break now and I guess then do questions afterwards. Yeah, no. So, all right, thank you very much.